Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorod and Mary Jo Foley, episode 230, recorded October 14th, 2011. The start menu is a lie. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. GoToAssist Express by Citrix puts IT professionals in position to do what they do best, access, diagnose, and resolve. Try it free for 30 days. Visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by the Newegg Gadget Trade Insight powered by Gazelle. Trade in your used gadgets today at newegg.com slash trade and receive a Newegg gift card. That's newegg.com slash trade. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 20% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code WINDOWS10. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything Windows. I'm Tom Merritt, filling in for Leo Laporte, joined by Paul Therott, news editor for Windows IT Pro, and, of course, the man in charge of winsupersite.com, and don't forget, author of Windows Phone Secrets, and Mary Jo Foley from allaboutmicrosoft.com, and blogger at ZDNet, and former co-worker. Hi, Mary Jo. Yes. Hi, Tom. <laughs> good to be hosted a show with you. Yes, agreed. And uh, always good to be back with Paul Therott. You too, sir. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm uh, I'm sorry Leo couldn't make it. He had to take a break. I think he's actually <laughs> back in okay. town. Okay. <laughs> he, had to t he had to take a vacation. He had to take a break. Mostly from, from you two from guys. Mostly. <laughs> no, not Mary Jo so much. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's uh, let's start off with the uh, biggest news that just broke this morning uh, after the EU approved the Skype purchase. Oh, please be uh, something about Google Plus. Microsoft oh. announced they're buying Google Plus. No, Microsoft <laughs> announced that the uh, Skype purchase is official. Uh, in fact, they say there's a couple of countries here and there that they still got to catch up on, but mostly they have closed on it. So uh, it is now officially a division of Microsoft. Uh, which is crazy when you think about it. Why, I'm not sure why Skype needs to be a division. You know, it seems like it should be rolled into something. Well, where but, would you roll it into? Yeah, that's tough because uh, it's a it's sort of a consumer product right now, but obviously they probably have designs on the enterprise market as well. So I guess they intend to infuse it into as much stuff as possible. Yeah, they, they could they could put it in online ser online services, you know, with Bing. Yep. But they might be afraid that might make the profits of that division tank even more, it, perhaps. This, this might have been something they did for the CEO of Skype to uh, sweeten the deal, you know, make it a division, allow him to be the president of that division, and he'll have some, you know, uh, prominent role going forward uh, in Microsoft. So, well, yeah, he, he becomes be the president of the division, right? Yeah. And uh, they're talking about integrating it in everything they can think of. Uh, <laughs> Although they're being curiously unspecific about that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are I mean, they that was the one exactly. thing I looked at. And when I looked at that announcement this morning, I wanted to see some clue. You know, here's a product where we're definitely going to do it, or here's one, you know. And they really didn't do that that I could see. Yeah, they've, they've said it was going to be in, like Paul said, just about everything. I mean, it's going to be in Xbox Live. It's going to be in Windows Phone. It's going to be in Office, probably, in Link, their unified communications product. So, I mean, there's, there's probably almost not a product it isn't going to be in. And you can like, imagine a Skype button right on Internet Explorer, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it would go well in the live services as well in that way. Yeah. Yep. They're not going to, uh, they're not going to replace Link, though, right? It's, it's going to be supplementary. I know. I, they, I just talked to Link in Boston, and, of course, this approval hadn't occurred yet, so they couldn't really talk too much about Skype. But the vibe I got from them was that, no, they, they're not going to replace Link. And what's the difference between Link and Skype for people who don't know? Um, everyone's heard of Skype and no one's heard of Link. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> no, I, I think they have different architectures, frankly. Um, yeah. And I think they serve uh, different markets now, although that could obviously change. Um, and I'm going to get this wrong and I'm, I'm, I'm going to overgeneralize, but I think uh, Link basically relies on centralized servers and Skype does not. Skype is more of a distributed, more, more of a yeah, yeah. system, yeah. free and easy. And also at the um, at the financial analyst meeting, 
they Steve Ballmer made a big point of saying Link is kind of our in, inside the corporate firewall solution and Skype is what's going to let us extend that to partners who are outside the firewall. So that was kind of how they were explaining how yeah, there's a think. there's a big limitation in Link if you get it through Office 365 that you can't use it to replace a phone system. It doesn't mm -hmm. have that capability. You need the on-prem version of Link for that. And I think one of the coolest things about Skype is that it absolutely is designed to replace a phone. You know, a lot of the people that use it use it to communicate with people who might be in other countries or other parts of the same country that are far away, and it's just a really cheap way to communicate, not just audio but also video. So, I, I mean, I could see that being part of the push going forward, you know, pushing Skype as this, you know, kind of modern IP-based uh, replacement for the phone, essentially. Yeah, Microsoft essentially can become a telephone company. We can serve enterprise with Link. Uh, we can put Skype on, on your Windows phone. We can put it on mm -hmm. your Xbox, you know, you could, and it's all the same yeah. account. Although I, I think there's something to be said for having a brand that makes, you know, that, that does that for everything. And on that note, I guess Skype, already, you know, clearly has the better brand. Sure. Than Link, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't make the marketing decisions there. But it seems like that's the way it should be. How does Skype play into Windows Phone Mango in, in, into Windows Phone? So, so far, far, it there's doesn't. Not even a client, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it doesn't. Well, they've, you know, in the sense that you can say anything, and that doesn't mean it's ever going to be true. I, I think it was the CEO of Skype or somebody from Skype or who pledged that the Windows Phone version of the Skype mobile app would be the best of all the mobile apps. Now, that said, there isn't one, so I guess that could change it's in the future. <laughs> yeah. They, yeah still although jo Joe Belfiore talked about it, remember, Paul, around um, when they when they had that big mango rollout that you, I think you were here in New York. Back they, in New York, They yeah. kind of said, yeah, it's coming, and we're, we're working on it, but um, they didn't really give a lot of details and no launch details. I, I think they're... They were basically waiting for Mango because some of the new Mango phones have front-facing cameras. So that's where it would make a lot more sense mm -hmm. to have a Skype And application. it has that background, uh, multi, you know, uh, background task, multitasking and so forth that is important for a communications app where maybe as on a phone, you want to be talking to somebody while you're doing something else, which wasn't possible before Mango uh, with a third-party app. Now, the other thing to think about here is what Microsoft might do to change Skype. I mean, everybody's mm -hmm. a little nervous about that. They're used to Skype sort of being untouched. It was the neglected child of eBay for many years, <laughs> and so it just sort of <laughs> stayed the same. Uh, and, and I guess... It was all uh, about synergy, Tom. <laughs> and I guess they've already made... Uh, yeah, that's a hell of a synergy. Uh, they, yeah. they, they made one change already in the Windows distribution. This is for Mary yeah. Jo, so I'll let her... Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that was um, Tom Warren at WinRumors actually noticed this this morning that uh, the, the Windows version, they've already taken out the Google toolbar distribution that was bundled in with it. So, you know, that's not too surprising, right? I mean, I wouldn't... But I think wouldn't of all the lost revenues there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, you know, so they got rid I of the crapware. Think... That's great. Yeah, that's yeah. not such a well, bad I... thing, is it? Well, one thing you can bet they're already thinking about is, you know, how, how are we going to actually have some paid versions of Skype? Because they're not just going to say, okay, free, that's the way it is, and that's, you know, what we're going to do. It's loss leader. I mean, they're going to continue. Skype already has some paid business yeah, versions. and Yeah, so, I mean, I, I can bet there's going to be a lot more of those kind of SKUs and, and different ways that it's it probably, you know, keep some free version that's an ad supported and then do some paid versions so i think i think you'll see them tweaking kind of what bundles are available for skype and what kinds of things small business might want versus a larger business that would use it in conjunction with link and office 365 so i think you'll see those kind of bundles coming to the front i can't wait to see the uh, licensing guys get their fingers on, oh, on skype they'll turn it into something truly confusing you know <laughs> there'll be all these mm -hmm. Enterprise agreement versions and volume license yep. agreement versions. How many versions of Skype do you expect, <laughs> expect yeah, to see? <laughs> Skype Pro, Skype Home. Yep. Uh, do you think overall, Mary Jo, that this will end up being a net positive for consumers because of Microsoft's firepower? Or will Microsoft change it in a way that it actually becomes less useful? Well, you know, one, one thing they've said, and this came up in my comments today a lot, people are like, oh, you can just bet they're going to kill the Mac version, they're going to kill the iPad version, they're going to kill it. No, right. they're not going to do that, actually. Yeah. That's right. the opposite of what they're going to do. That's sort of the knee-jerk um, so assumption, they, but they wouldn't do that. That wouldn't is. make any sense. No. 
No, it's like how, you know, how they're supporting Bing on multiple platforms that aren't all from Microsoft and some of the Office applications, same thing. Um, so I think they're going to continue supporting those versions um, on other platforms. Um, and that's that's not going to change at all. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. You know, they have mobile versions too. In some ways, that's a much yeah. bigger deal, right? There's Skype on Android and um, iPhone. Those are the big ones. But I think it's on Symbian. It's probably on... BlackBerry, I haven't looked at the list, but it's, you know, they're basically on everything. And I just don't see them changing that unless, yeah. uh, I don't know if they're, they're on some oddball, uh, you know, OSs that are out on the edge somewhere. But There's no Skype for my playbook yet. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't hold your don't breath hold for your that. Breath. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the one, the one thing I think a lot of people would love to see is Microsoft make Skype more reliable, obviously, because yeah. um, yeah. that's... You know, but they don't want them to change it too much, but, but they want them to make it more reliable. Yeah. And they sort of Sometimes. expect the opposite, don't they? I mean, you know, e it even is. this year before Microsoft bought them, every time Skype went down, you know, you heard, oh, Microsoft, they must have changed something. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just it's like, so, it's so crazy. It actually would have been think. illegal, I think. Yeah, exactly. They, they yeah. Like, they could have had any impact at all in that company. You know, Skype bought another company this year since Microsoft announced their intention to buy Skype. Right. What, what, what you know, was that company? company clearly did its own thing there. Yeah. Group me. It was group, called GroupMe. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because GroupMe is like the uh, the group messaging service you can use on your phone. I, I actually used GroupMe at uh, DragonCon to, to kind of keep oh, in well. touch with a bunch of people. Worked really right. well. I don't know how Skype's going to integrate it. I don't know what Microsoft's going to do with it either. But uh, yeah, I, I hope, my big hope is that we actually see Microsoft apply some quality control so that these new releases of Skype aren't just awful every time we get a, a, a point upgrade and we have to wait two or three upgrades. I'm actually running an older version of Skype on purpose yeah. because I know I know what it does wrong and can work around it. And I don't want to go I, to the I like the room. way they randomly change it in every version, actually. I, to me, that's just exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it does keep, keep yeah. you on your toes. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how it's going to be different this time. It's like moving into a new house every time you upgrade Skype. Where yeah. is it? Didn't the door handle used to be on the left side? Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of Microsoft openness, uh, Microsoft and Linux lying down together in a, in a big new way, creating two new Hadoop distributions, one for WinServer and one for Azure. Yes. Very surprising announcement this so week. So, essentially, uh, is this Microsoft making a Linux distro? Kind of. It I mean, sort of is, right? It is, sort of. Um, you know, they're partnering with the um, company that spun off from Yahoo called Hortonworks. Um, and so that's who's actually doing the work with Microsoft. Um, so that was Yahoo's Hadoop installation that then they spun out? Yeah, it was. it's a group of people who worked on that yeah, at okay. Yahoo. Gotcha. who spun themselves out as a separate company. And so Microsoft's partnering with them and they're developing two different things. They're developing a service that sits on Windows Azure that's going to let you um, tap into Hadoop for big data needs. And then there's going to be a Windows Server um, on-premises version. And, and Hortonworks is working on both of these with Microsoft. Um, and the most interesting part of the whole deal, though, is then once this is once these two distributions are developed, Microsoft's going to offer them back to the Yahoo, uh, sorry, to the Apache and the Hadoop community to see if they want to incorporate the changes they made into the core distribution. So they don't have to take that, but it's pretty interesting. Microsoft is going to be contributing that because it's open source software and they're going by the rules there and playing by the rules. As they would. Well, yeah, I think they, they, they have to, right, under the, the Apache yeah. license? Yeah. I mean, again, Apache doesn't have to take the contributions sure. back. Um, and so that's still, you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But it's just really interesting to see Microsoft even doing this at all. I, I, I've talked to a few people in the open source community, and they, they were surprised. Everybody was like, okay, where's the catch? Where's the loophole? Yeah, this is yeah. too weird. <laughs> so um, it was very interesting to see that. Uh, they also kept that whole announcement under, pretty much under wraps, too, um, which was surprising as well. Um, but, yeah, it was a big announcement at the SQL Pass show this week um, in Seattle. And... People were just really kind of surprised and stunned that I talked to. Now I know I know Hadoop is a, is an Apache uh, based Linux distribution, but can you explain a little more for people what it actually does? Um, it lets you store unstructured data. Um, so Which, you know, Microsoft, in enterprise, that's a huge that's a huge that's booming huge. business it's, right now. Yeah, right. It's huge for the enterprise, and Microsoft is taking its database. Um, tools, you know, they do a lot of um, SQL Server analytics kind of tools, and they're going to allow those to tap into Hadoop. 
Um, so it's it's really pretty cool for somebody in the enterprise or even not in the enterprise who wants to use Microsoft tools to tap into all this data that's going to be able to be stored in Hadoop. And you know that way you don't you can store your structured data data in SQL Server, your unstructured data in Hadoop, get those two things to work together, uh, interoperate. So there's a lot of interesting angles for people who um, have those have those kind of needs. Um, as, and another interesting point to me um, about this announcement this week was Microsoft's been making its own um, competitor to Hadoop as well, which is codenamed Dryad, now known as Link to SQL. And um, I asked Microsoft when I heard about this, I'm like, so what happens to Dryad? Like, are, are you guys done? You, you're throwing in the towel? You said, okay, Hadoop won. And they're not, actually. They're going to continue to still support Dryad for people who are more in the .NET community, um, who are more comfortable with that model. And for people who aren't afraid of Java, they're going to have the option to go with Hadoop since Hadoop is written in Java. So I'm afraid of Java. You're, I, I knew you were afraid. <laughs> <laughs> you you know, well, Microsoft doesn't get a lot of credit for this, but some, someday um, there will be this understanding that they have reached out to the open source community in, in hundreds of different ways. There are lots of little projects within Microsoft to bring open source web development tools into Visual Studio and so forth. And, I, I, think, I look at this as just part of that bigger picture. You know, this is more of that interoperability work with the outside world. Microsoft's kind of implicit agreement that the future is a little more heterogeneous than the past was, and uh, that that's just the way things are going to be going forward. It's very pragmatic, and they don't really talk about it from a big picture standpoint all that often, and maybe they should, because I think it's um, widely misunderstood by people. It's a. It's been a slow approach, like uh, approaching a wild animal. They've just kind of <laughs> exactly. creeped forward and realized. Well, <laughs> well wait because a they're so mistrusted, you yeah. know, by these people. And so I think every little good that they do, every little bit of interoperability where there isn't a hidden agenda or a little gotcha there, you know, over time I think that's going to build up and and they're going to come, you know, kind of come to understand that uh, yes, Microsoft competes with us, but they also can cooperate with us and. These things can work together, and it's better for everybody when they do. I I I feel like some people are going to look at this and say, "Well, this, this is tantamount to Microsoft acting like Red Hat. They're they're taking a Linux distribution and 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 capitalizing on it." Is that fair to say, Mary Jo? Mm. Um, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I haven't heard anybody else think of it that way. Maybe but that's just I the mean, people in my mind. Then <laughs> <laughs> I think of it as, uh, as them as perverting it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or subverting it, <laughs> yeah. perhaps. I mean, I, I think it remains to be seen, you know, how first, you know, how long does it take them to get this distribution out? Um, because they're going to have a CTP, which is their test build, out on Azure this year. Um, the first test build for Windows Server is next year, and they're giving us no dates when, when either of those things will ever be final. Um, you know, it could be next year, it could be after that. So it, it's going to take a while. And then again, see how how the uh, community reacts when Microsoft offers those contributions back. I think I think it's going to kind of be like, uh, let's see what the community thinks of what they did um, and how open they are to taking back some of those things and making it part of the core. Um, and, and I think that that'll be when people actually say, okay, they actually are doing this for the right reasons. They're in this for the customer um, and they're not trying to do some subversive kind of thing, which again, I don't think they are either, but um, you know, that's, that's kind of well, the perception. But they have to deal with that charge. I mean, people are going to say Yeah, that. exactly. Oh, of course. Yeah. No, this is not going to be without controversy and friction. I'm sure there's going to be right. something they do totally out of the best of intentions that's going to turn bad for some reason here and there. Those missteps will happen. <laughs> but, but if they get past all that, uh, I think this could be huge as far as bringing Microsoft and Linux together, you know, it, it may not, all in, in one happy family necessarily, but but sort of putting aside a lot of that past bad feelings, uh, other than the uh, the occasional patent kerfuffle. I, you know, I think Microsoft really has decided yeah. Linux is not the enemy. Well, but even even that is not. I mean, people see that I guess for what it is. But remember, you know, from Microsoft's perspective, um, they make big bets on software and they invent things, and, and in some cases, they buy things, whatever, and. You know, they do come from the proprietary software world, and um, I understand why on the Linux side or the Android side, people kind of grumble about the patent stuff. I get it. And I sort of get the general argument that, you know, these companies should be able to compete on their own merits, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, but, you know, patents are part of that company's merit <laughs> and, and part of their intellectual property, part of their 
uh, of what they are and what they own and all that, and, and they need to protect that. I mean, I don't, I, this is in some ways a fundamental philosophical difference between these two communities that's probably never going to be bridged. But, you know, from Microsoft's perspective, these companies are stealing from it, you know, and. Uh, and from their like perspective, the Microsoft is using the law to crush them. That's <laughs> uh, what's the, well, but why? I mean, you know, you're competing. You're going to crush them however you can legally, sure. and one of the ways would be the law. I mean, if if you're acting illegally and not getting crushed, I mean, uh, why is that any worse than what Microsoft's doing, protecting its own patents? So, yeah. you know, I, I, look, I I happen to fall on uh, I guess the Microsoft side of the fence in this case, but I, I do understand where these people are coming from. But I, you know, look. When you're going to back uh, an open source uh, software model, you have to expect this kind of thing, unfortunately. And well, I, 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 I interpret this story to mean what Microsoft has realized is we're not competing with the Linux open source community. We're competing with Red Hat. We're competing with individual yeah. companies yeah. that are using this. And we can use it to our own advantage where it works for us. And here's one place it, it, where we can. I don't know what the numbers are along these lines, but I would imagine that most of the companies that are licensing Microsoft patents who, uh, you know, sell or distribute Linux uh, things or Android devices or whatever they are, are in fact entering into a cross-license agreement where Microsoft is also licensing some intellectual property that they own. Sure. Uh, if you can find an example where that's not a case, then that other company is truly worthless <laughs> because what, what exactly are they bringing to the table? They've apparently just stolen something and they're now selling it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I would imagine most of these companies have own some intellectual property of their own, whatever it may be. I think the feeling sometimes is that, uh, I, I, I'll get your opinion on this, Mary Jo, is that sometimes those patents may be in, is invalid or overbroad or or they were thought of by Linux oh, first, but the open source community they need to be tested, patented, yes. all that, all that yeah. sort of thing, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, and we don't, we, uh, you know, we don't know what those patents are, right? If we're talking about Android and we're just talking about Linux, you know, uh, Microsoft, to, you know, very famously said they believe that Linux and open source infringed on over 200 of their patents a few years back. But, you know, as many people in the open source community came forward and said, so which ones? They've never yeah, actually yeah. said yeah. which ones. <laughs> um, you know, and they, they tell the companies when they are in negotiations with them, they have them sign a non-disclosure agreement, then they tell them, okay, so these are the ones that are we are infringing on. Um, but we don't really know what they tell them or, you know, because it's all covered under NDA. So we don't really know what the terms are there. Um, well, on the other so hand, most of them sense. have signed, so right? Not, right? Not many companies have fought back. Right. I Only guess. the two famous ones fighting them are Barnes and Noble and uh, Motorola. Uh, those are yep. the two that are still saying no. Um, Red Hat's still saying no uh, in terms of Linux. Uh, I don't know if they've gone after them recently about that, but for a while they were really trying to get Red Hat to sign, um, and they never did. Um, but, you know, go, going back to the Hadoop thing for a second, you know, I, I was thinking you were calling it a, a Linux distribution. It's not exactly a mm -hmm. Linux distribution per se. Okay. I mean, and this, and this kind of gets back to, um, you know, Microsoft still sees itself very strongly competing with Linux and Android and Chrome OS. Like on the operating system front, it doesn't see itself as being in the open source community. It sees itself as the adversary to those. But in in other parts of open source that sit on top of Windows, like Hadoop is going to, which is more like a software framework and a file system and, and a database, um, that's where they say, okay, there are possible synergies here. But in operating systems, no, you're our enemy in operating systems but you could be our friend if you do things that run on top of Windows and our operating system. That's a really good point, because I was making the mistake of, of thinking of, of the framework as the underlying operating system, but you're right, this is running on top of WinServer and Azure, right? So right. It's, it's, it's not Linux all the way down. No, no. All right, well, I'm, I'm glad we, we got that clear. So Microsoft is still <laughs> evil then, in, the open, in open source. <laughs> yeah, nothing has changed. Agreed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think we can agree this changes nothing. <laughs> All right, good. Well, that's a good point to uh, take a quick break uh, and thank our sponsor, GoToAssist. Uh, two things IT professionals and their clients have in common. Uh, they want the bugs and the broken things to go away, and they want them to go away really fast. Uh, and that's why GoToAssist Express is perfect for anyone in IT. It's brought to you by Citrix, puts clients at ease with simple and secure remote support, and puts you in a position to do what you do best, access the problem access the computer, diagnose what's wrong, and resolve it in an easy and fast way. You just you connect to your clients, lets you work quickly and accurately. You can even fix the problem without the person being there. Uh, once, once you're in, uh, you can do everything that they would do, uh, and it's fast and secure. 
You can view another computer online, control it so you can resolve those technical issues, even work while your customers are off getting some coffee or going to the movies. Uh, boost your productivity. Maybe not theirs if they're going <laughs> off to the movies, but can boost theirs too because you get them back to work even faster. Try Go to Assist Express free for 30 days. That's go to assist.com slash windows. And we thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. Back to the news. Uh, windows phone chief coming out with some harsh words against the competition. Yeah, and God bless them. It's about time. You know, the past decade, I think Microsoft has been too wishy-washy. And, uh, you know, even Windows Phone, I mean, in some ways, it took kind of the soft approach, you know. So this past week, Andy Lee's finally gave us some, uh, you know, some news bites or whatever, some, uh, you know, some, some quips about the competition, which I think is good. So, as, you know, from the iPhone perspective, I think he described the iPhone 4S as kind of a weak uh, release, which I believe it to be, and that this is an opening for Windows Phone, and we'll see if they can take advantage of that. And then he talked about the chaotic nature uh, of the Android market, which is absolutely true. I mean, you know, Android is a is a mess. <laughs> so, um, so good. I mean, I, I'd like to see this continue. Unfortunately, you know, history suggests that this will be the last time we ever hear from this guy. But you know, this is <laughs> the way. You know, this is the way I like to see these guys talk. I mean, they have an awesome product, and they should be out. You know, pushing it, pushing it really hard. Now, he didn't say anything about rim, but that would just be kicking a dog while it's down. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. They don't, well, uh, although actually, I didn't. You know, I've been traveling, so I didn't catch this. Maybe you did. I'm I, yeah, I didn't hear it either. More, but I know that the developer guys from Windows Phone, I think they um, made an open petition to uh, to get Rim developers over to Windows Phone this week as well, if I'm not mistaken. Does that does that ring a bell with anybody? Um, I think they were doing that with the uh, Nokia developers, right? Um, yeah, but, but I think the, they, they did. did the, do, I think they made the same ben, offer. Now that you're mentioning it, it rings a bell. Yeah. Yeah, Ben, ben yeah, Rudolph came came out um, on Twitter when all of this was happening and said, "If I want to get the 25 best stories of people who've been completely disrupted by the BlackBerry outage, and I'll give you a free Windows phone if you give us the best story." Okay, that's. And, I mean, those are the kind of things they need to do. You know to get the word out, to get people to think, hey, you know what, there is an alternative, and Microsoft actually has something that's credible. Yeah, they can make those it one of those self-help ads, you know, where the guy's like, uh, I was trying to get email on my BlackBerry, and it wouldn't do anything, and then I lost my job, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> so, I mean, they should have some awesome sob story like that. <laughs> Are you suggesting that Microsoft should come out with a campaign saying that RIM is eliminating jobs? Yeah, yeah, I think I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, you, know, you can I, see I, why I don't run a company. Eh? I know what you mean because, you know, I actually don't think the iPhone 4S is any different uh, than the iPhone 3GS. It's an incremental upgrade. It's what Apple does. It's yep. going to be hugely popular. Uh, they added just enough to, to be able to make it different that people want to get it. Uh, Android Marketplace... I'm not even sure that's true, but... Oh, yeah, well, okay, but it, it is true. Obviously, people are buying sold it, a million in pre-orders, and they're, some, yep. they're expecting to sell four million this weekend if that holds out. Yep. Android Marketplace in disarray, though, what, do you, what, what does that mean? Well, Just the Android market, open? and we don't mean the Android marketplace like the online store. We mean the the market. You know, Sorry, I meant the market. Yeah, the collective market for Android devices. The Android ecosystem is a disaster, and the reason is because it's completely open, and people who make these devices or sell the devices can do whatever they want with them. So some devices come out and they get upgraded pretty quickly to new software versions. Some get upgraded really slowly. Some don't get upgraded at all. That's and true. What you Windows now have is this phone kind of, in the past, though. I guess Mango yeah. went pretty well. So, yeah, Mango seems to have gone well, but I, I think the underlying difference, the big underlying difference between the two ecosystems is that Microsoft, uh, based on its experiences with Windows Mobile, has more control over what constitutes a Windows phone. So there aren't, you know, 17 different screen resolutions and there aren't, you know, all these different types of devices. You know, they're all consistent to a point that makes sense. They all, you know, you're guaranteed certain kinds of hardware, certain minimum specs and so forth certain levels of performance you know so you don't have these uh weird situations where you go into a store uh, into an online store in this case try to download an app and then you have to really pay attention to the fine print you know will this work with my device and uh this you know android has obviously been phenomenally successful but as more and more of these devices get out in the world uh this market this um you know i guess ecosystem becomes more and more fragmented and i think it's going to become more and more of an issue because Google, of course, is moving very quickly and releasing new software versions of Android. And those aren't going to be available to people. You know, uh, on the Apple side, you have a very consistent upgrade strategy. They're very clear about who gets what and 
generally speaking, uh, if your device is within, say, two, two and a half years, you, you pretty much get the new software version for free, and that's nice. Uh, Windows Phone, so far at least, because of the consistency, everyone gets Mango for free. That's great. Hopefully that will be the case with the next major version, too. We'll see. Um, you know, but on Android, there's no, it's a roulette wheel. You have no idea. And That's I, a mess. I, I, think, I feel like Windows Phone sort of splits the difference between the Apple model, where it's we, we control everything, and the Android yeah. model, where we only control the operating system and nothing else. Windows is trying to say, we want some of those benefits of controlling everything, but, yeah. but keep it open to multiple models and not yeah, have to I mean, the Obviously, itself. there's a glass half full and then a glass half empty view of that. <laughs> but, yeah, sure. You know, the glass half full version is that's the best of both worlds. You get the, the benefits of a curated marketplace, which is I, I think is actually important. Um, you get that consistency of devices. You get that guarantee that you're going to get the upgrades, uh, which I also think is important. So we'll see. Now, on the other hand, you don't get the crazy range of device types that are just possible when something is truly open, right? So you can't, I, I would have to invent a, a device type, but, you know, you, it, these devices all basically look the same. I mean, some of them have a keyboard, but most don't. And the ones that don't, you know, they're all kind of interchangeable. They're, they're very similar. So the differentiators there are a little more subtle. Uh, say than they can be on, on Android. Mary Jo, you were going to say something. I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off. No, that's fine. Um, I was going to say, you know, Paul's analogy, you know, which a lot of people are making, are making it. They're saying the Android marketplace is exactly what happened to Windows Mobile, right? And yeah. I, I don't know if you remember, but when Windows Mobile phones were out, you could see somebody with the phone and you wouldn't even know it was a Windows Mobile phone. Like, they all look so different. I mean, the hardware didn't look so radically different, but the operating system looked different. The way things were implemented looked different. And I think yep. there's something to be said for a consistent branding and look and feel on devices, even if they're from different makers. It, it just kind of solidifies the brand. It makes it easier to write apps um, that behave in a common way. Um, so, that you know, there, it's like Microsoft's already had its Android moment, and now they've kind of passed by that and gone to a different model because... That old model didn't work for them. Yeah. Android is like an extreme reaction to iOS, but it's one that almost doesn't take into account what happened with Windows Mobile. You know, I, I, this is probably going to be true of Android eventually as well, but I would say in the last few years that Windows Mobile was, a, was Microsoft's mobile system, that, one of the, that more systems went out the door from hardware makers with a new UI on top of the original then did not. You know, people were just replacing... Like TouchWiz and SenseUI and all yeah. those things. Yeah, and people yeah. who didn't would just go buy their own, you know, on the side. Those were probably very well-selling or within the context of that market. It reminded uh, me of all of, remember all those those uh, interfaces that, that desktop manufacturers would try to put over Windows 98? Ugh, yeah. Yep. And the <laughs> first thing you'd have to do with a new desktop is figure out where to go to turn it off. Uh, I can't, I hate stuff like that. Yeah. You know? it's, uh, I, Google's trying, so, it seems to be trying to get away from that, but that, I think that's your point is that they have to yeah. try to get away from that. And to do that means asserting more control over the platform. I think for most phones and on Android going forward, certainly, that when people go in to buy that thing, the, the fact that it's compatible with Android, whatever collection of hundreds of thousands of Android apps there are in the world, that's a bullet point. But in many ways, I bet to the typical consumer, they're not buying an Android phone. I don't think that's the point. They're buying whatever is supposedly the best phone that day. And it may, it may be because it has 4G or NFC or whatever some of these leading edge features are. You know, these people uh, have a phone for two years their contract is up, they go into the store, what's the best phone? And it's always going to be an Android phone, but, you know, it, it will have different things, you know, maybe a different UI and di different uh, particular features, different bundled services, whatever it may be. And I bet for a lot of these people, the fact that it's Android is probably not even a selling point or, or the selling point. You know, that they're not there looking for Android. They're there looking for the best phone. Yeah, I wonder. And that, you know, that was the other thing that came out this week with when Lee's made all these comments was he he reiterated that Microsoft's going to finally start putting some marketing dollars into training yep. reps in in the phone stores and probably compensating with commissions. I would think also, um, so that when you walk into a Verizon store and you say <coughs> what is the best phone, you don't automatically get an Android phone because that's who's paying them the most commission, or an iPhone. Right. You're going to actually have salespeople who know about Windows Phone and want to sell it to you. You won't have to beg to buy it like some of us have had to. 
Yeah, I yeah. think or, Android is starting to get a little bit of currency and more people happen to just know, I know what an Android phone is, uh, uh -huh. kind of in a vague way. But that's something Windows already has. You know what, you know, oh, Windows, that's Microsoft, that's what's on my desktop. Windows does. Windows phone certainly doesn't, right? Nobody understands what that means. Uh, and I think that, I guess the important thing is, uh, in many ways, people who own a smartphone now are kind of lost uh, to the makers of other smartphone OSs because when you buy an Android device, assuming you don't have an absolutely horrible experience, which I suppose is possible, you know, you may, for consistency's sake, go get the next Android phone the next time around. I bet Apple customers tend to go from iPhone to iPhone. I bet the majority of them do, you know, because they're having a good experience. It's the safe way route. They've already, you know, they bought apps and uh, in the movies ecosystem. and TV yeah. shows and whatever, and, and they're locked into that environment, and it's fine because it's a good environment. But I think to the wider world, you know, this, this market that's going to be this huge computing market of the future, um, I bet they don't know what Android is, you know, most of them. And, I, and, you know, as these phones come down in price and they feel like maybe we can afford one of these things now, you know, again, I, I, people who are just average consumers always want whatever the best thing is for the money, you know. And like Mary Jo said, I mean, today, people, those decisions are guided by the people who work in the stores, whose decisions on the part of consumers are guided by the commissions they get. And the commissions they're getting right now are largely on, are for Android phones. Let's move on to Windows 8. Uh, I have been among the people complaining about the new start screen in Windows 8. I've got the developer preview uh, running here. And here's what happens. You've got the start button <laughs> down there in the corner. You, yep. you hover over it. It says start. You press start. And it what happened? It took me to a big blank green thing. Actually, usually it's a little faster than that. But it, it, it takes you to a, uh, uh, a tile map. Somehow yep. I got into the, uh, the build conference app without realizing it. So this isn't the this isn't the, the best <laughs> demo here, uh, but yeah. So I mean, this this is uh, this is what's going on, which is you you click on the start screen, it's right, taking you to the metro interface instead of what you're used to. Th this is a complex topic, believe it or not, <laughs> because the problem is this thing is a developer preview. There's nothing in it. There's sample apps written by interns. Right. They're not very interesting. Which is uh, why none of them I are going to replace just got Microsoft Word app. or Photoshop. Yeah. yeah. You know. Um, and you, as a user of 2011, uh, are going to install apps that we have today, which run under the desktop. So from our perspective right now, which is a, a slice in time, this thing doesn't make sense because I'm using this newfangled thing, which has cute Fisher-Price applications in it, to launch the apps I really need to run, which are back on that desktop, and how come it doesn't work the way it did before? You know, and I, I think this is a, a matter of time and perspective that... As time goes on, we're going to see better and more apps. We're going to see the Windows Store open up in, during the beta process. And we're going to uh, finally have apps that can replace those desktop apps that we rely on today. And um, the, the Windows 8 experience that we get in January or next June or this time next year, whenever it is, is going to be very different than the one we get today. So a lot of the complaining, I think, today is just slice and time stuff. So... Um, you may never be pleased by this because you're a power user. And for a lot of those people, you know, they're going to want to go back to that desktop for whatever reason, and that's okay too. But, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in some ways in the things that haven't changed. I'm very interested in Microsoft's reaction to the complaints, um, which, in, uh, which I actually feel are not as level-headed as what I just said. But, well, you know, Steve some Sinofsky stuff does... Wrote, wrote an ode. Yeah, he wrote, like, the tech... <laughs> blog post version of War and Peace, well, in three parts, <laughs> you know. Um, and actually, I'm not sure he wrote, actually, I think other people wrote most of that stuff. But, um, you know, here's a history of the start menu. Here's what we did in the start screen in Windows 8. And then, oh, my God, everyone complained. So here's some thoughts about all your complaints. And, uh, you know, what you're, I mean, what you need to understand is that at the end of the day, which is my favorite anti-phrase, is that... They're not really changing it, <laughs> so <Right. laughs> um, they they have the data to prove that you're wrong. So your complaints are interesting, and please keep them coming. But, because you want uh, we want you to feel like you're being heard. Yeah, I mean they'll make little concessions. You know, um, it's funny that uh, there are already things they knew when they released this particular build that there were things wrong with it. Um, uh, I had a discussion with one of the guys from Microsoft about uh, some of those issues and. I already know what's going to happen is they're going to fix them because they already knew they were wrong. But people are complaining about them right now. 
And so the beta version will come out and it will be different. So we won't have to right. mouse down to the corner to make that overlay come up. And then people will say, oh, look, they fixed that thing that I complained about. They really are listening. Well, my, and, my complaint is I yeah, actually want the old-fashioned start menu as an option. And maybe, they, yeah. maybe they'll put that option in. I mean, that's the thing about moving from one I version of Windows to another. I'm, I'm such an old fart that I just want to have it look and work exactly the same way as my last version worked, except better. So I go and I turn off the interface and I reset it to classic. Uh, and I do all well, of that I, stuff. How do you feel about, well, how do you feel about OS X Lion? And uh, I don't remember what it's called, but the, the full screen iOS style. Oh, yeah, no, I think that's, that's ridiculous. I don't you even. You hate that stuff, yeah. right? So, yeah. But the thing is, if you if you use that stuff enough, um, it actually works okay. Yeah. You know? In other um, words, if I just jump in, I'd get used to it. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you had to use it every day. You know, it, Windows 8 is tough because you rely on what uh, sort of the, the PC version of muscle memory. You know, um, I go down and click the start button all the time. Well, actually, I, I tap the start keyboard button, but and I start a start menu search. So I, I do this all day long. I'll be How working in something that? I need to run. And I hit start, and I start typing. The I just made thing a miniature start works. menu come up. But that actually works. Yeah, that's all I want, it really. It still works. Yeah, how did that happen? How did what happen? That? Yeah. You mouse, do, you, you, okay, so you mouse off of that yeah. and click the desktop. Right. Now just mouse all the way into the corner. Don't click anything. Just mouse in all the way. Ah. Right. By the way, that's not how, well, I don't know on the desktop, but right now that's how it works on the start screen as well. Mm -hmm. That's not how it's going to work in the final build. So they're going to change that. But as long as you give me something like that, that's all I really want. Yeah. Okay, I Steve mean, Sanofsky, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> the, the thing that keeps coming up in these posts, which they still aren't answering, even despite how many words these posts are, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people are like, I, I don't want to see the tile interface. I want to be able to just go straight to the desktop interface. And I don't want to see these tiles. I just don't want that. It's not good for business. It's great for your consumers, not good for enterprise. And, yeah. you know, the question keeps coming back. Are, you, are they going to let people do that? I think the answer is no. Um, but what they're telling people to do is if you really want to, like, automatically go to the desktop, why don't you just take the desktop tile and put it in a very prominent place on your mm -hmm. tiled interface? And that's the way you can do it. But some people are saying, I want you to make it so I can have my administrators lock it down so that when I boot, boom, I go to desktop. Now, I, but so I don't think it's ever th going to happen. I thought I remembered them saying at Build that you would be able to customize your enterprise installs to do that, but maybe I'm imagining it. I, I thought, too. I thought I, there was a suggestion that maybe there would be a group policy Me for too. that. Uh, okay. Because, you know, and they told me this months and months but ago, I, actually. I asked again. I'm sorry? No, I said, I asked them again this week. I'm like, I thought you guys had said there might be a group yeah, policy yeah. setting where you could just do that. And and they said, well, we're not saying yes and we're not saying no. But if you read that latest post that came out this week, if you read I between know the lines. Nothing. That's like when the they killed the Zoom. No. <laughs> we're not saying it's dead, but we're not saying it's still exactly. alive. We're just That's in denial. We, we haven't made one in a while. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it's gonna we're one never going to make one. <laughs> we don't actually have a team of people working on one, but yeah. that doesn't mean we couldn't make one. You want to see us? You want to dare us? We'll make <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I have to say, I actually like the Metro interface for a tablet. If I was using a Windows tablet, I, I would be perfectly happy I, in that. It's just that... Seriously, it, it, I think there's going to be a huge group of consumers that are going to walk into stores and see that UI and say, oh my God, look at that thing. It looks like it's on an iPad, but it's this beautiful, colorful screen. And oh, it runs Windows apps. This is fantastic. I, you know, again... Our, our desire to go back to that desktop immediately is sort of predicated on the fact that everything we want to run now is on that desktop. That's yeah. the problem. And I think that's the reason they're not saying anything, because this is a wait and see, that, that your behavior and your needs and wants and so forth around this UI are going to change dramatically when the things you do run are, in fact, in that UI. I'll give them this. When I'm in the tile interface, Windows yep. D still takes me to the desktop. Yeah. Oh, a lot of the Windows keys, the yeah. things fantastically Been well. Using yeah, using that since 1995. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, for whatever it's worth, right, right on that screen when you're on the desktop start mm -hmm. menu search works exactly the way it did before. You hit, you tap the start button on the keyboard and just start typing, and it works exactly the same. It doesn't look the same, but it has the same result. So if you uh, just hit, if you I don't, you probably don't have a start button on your uh, no, I have yeah, I do. So could maybe Control Escape. Um, and then just start typing. It's just not responding. All right, it's so a virtual click, machine, then, so... Okay, so click the start button. Just click that. That will achieve the same effect. 
No, my mouse is frozen. Now your mouse doesn't work. All right, so this is a, a kind of a Steve Jobs-esque demo capability. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, here. Yeah, it's just look. I, I'm running out of things for you to do. I, I <laughs> was pretty much. Yeah, it's not. It's not, for some reason it's not bringing up the search, but I have made it do that before, so I'll I'll vouch for you there. <laughs> okay, it really does work. I promise. I promise. We'll we'll have uh, media room for you to try it out yourself later. All right, uh, let's take a uh, another quick break and uh, thank one of our other sponsors uh, for today, which uh, is uh, who is it? Um, Oh, it's, is it Squarespace? Yes, it is. Squarespace.com. <laughs> Sorry about that. Fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 20% off your new account for Squarespace, go to Squarespace.com. Use the code Windows 10, and you will have a beautiful-looking website. In fact, I've been telling people, uh, if you want to get like a little side business, go to Squarespace, create a site for a business, show it to them and say, look, this is a beautiful website. This is how much you're going to pay a month. You'll get 20% uh, off for six months. I'll hand over the keys to you. We actually had a guy do that for a hot dog uh, company in Chicago. He just was in the store eating a hot dog, created a website, showed it to the owner. The owner was like, that's amazing. Hand it over the keys, squarespace.com. Professional, reliable websites uh, available. You can try it out absolutely free. You don't have to pay a thing. Don't have to use a credit card. Just go to squarespace.com. If you do decide to keep it, use that offer code Windows 10, and you'll get 20% off for six months. We thank Squarespace for their support of Windows Weekly. Uh, we got a few more Windows 8 things to talk about. Uh, they made a lot of uh, promises on the way memory is going to be used uh, that should free up a lot of memory. Yes, they make promises every day, those guys at Microsoft. <laughs> well, that's why I phrased it that way, because I, I got excited reading yeah. this stuff. I'm like, that seems like that would work great. That I, seems like that I, yeah, would work so great. Yeah, so we have to take certain things on faith at this yeah. point. Um, the, the story is that Windows 8 has the same system requirements as Windows 7, but that, in fact, in many situations, will, in fact, use fewer system resources. You know, so Steven Sanofsky carted out this one gigahertz single core Atom-based netbook, and, you know, you can put them side by side and say, look, you know, Windows 7 actually uses more memory than Windows 8. Um, I, I think that Microsoft has been making incremental or evolutionary changes to the way that Windows works over the years and uh, in the form of componentization and, and loading things at certain, you know, in certain orders or eliminating the things that get loaded into memory. And it seems like with Windows 8, we've suddenly, you know, really moved into almost revolutionary capability because the thing really does boot up in seconds, which is amazing. And, you know, I, I guess you could, uh, some people claim there's some kind of chicanery going on there, but the fact remains, you know, you turn off the computer and then you turn it back on and you turn around and it's just sitting there waiting for you to log on. It, it's, it's impressive. So I th for me, from what I can tell, the, this stuff is in fact real. I mean, I don't have any stats to back it up. It's just based on using the thing. Yeah. Memory and combining searches, uh, system RAM for duplicate content, gets rid of yeah. uh, duplicates, uh, removed 13 different services and changed a number of others to automat from automatic to manual. Uh, mm -hmm. They consolidated various core but low-level components. And it's, it's supposedly it's just going to be smarter about which allocated memory it keeps and which it frees up. Yeah, the other thing I, I kind of enjoyed, I think it was at Bill. It must have been at Bill. I think it was Steven Snosky was talking about you know, the typical specifications for a smartphone that will ship in 2012, a dual core processor, gigabyte of RAM, you know, some form of storage, you know, 16 to 64 gigs of storage. And, you know, from Microsoft's perspective, that you just described a Windows PC, you know, that's, we could run Windows on that thing, you know. And, and I think Windows 8 is going to be a milestone of, of many kinds, but one of the milestones is going to be this notion that, you know, Windows doesn't have to just run on this big boxy computer. It can run on these very svelte kind of iPad type tablets. It can run on, you know, the big honking gaming, you know, rig and the servers and all that stuff and everything in between, you know. And uh, I think the success of Windows has always had to do a lot with its versatility. And I think that Windows 8 is, you know, at least the plan is for that to continue and then, you know, go to all these new device types. And, and you know, so far, so good. And then uh, you have a note for, to talk about the taskbar. I, I didn't see anything new about the taskbar. What's that about? Actually, Mary Jo has a note Oh, you that. got that, Mary Jo. Yeah, see, I can't just, tell whose notes are which. <laughs> I know. We, we should I don't know why. They're all in different <laughs> fonts. And... <laughs> no, no, they're not. Don't, don't, it's know, not rendering properly in Chrome. <laughs> 
Um, they did it another lengthy post this week on the Windows 8 blog about um, changes to the taskbar. And I didn't I actually didn't see a whole lot new there that they hadn't talked about before. But it again, went into more, you know, here's why we we're making the changes we're making. You know, here's the telemetry data proving that we're doing the right thing. Um, so if you're into Love all that explain. kind of stuff and you want to hear the backstory, um, you should go check God, out the taskbar. You know, I'm going to write yeah, a book I mean, about Windows 8, and I will not write as much as Steven Snofsky has already written. I, he will I, not. I, he's not kidding. I don't he's even really, know why really I'm writing are. it. Yeah. There's no point. Yeah. No. You know? I mean, the, the posts that are getting the most, I was looking today, posts getting the most comments on the Building Windows 8 blog are all about the start menu. I mean, those yeah. are the ones that kind of get people yep. kicked into gear. And I mean, I think the one they posted at the beginning of this week has over 560 comments on it. I mean, people, yeah. people have well, a lot you know to say on that topic. The, the, it, this is a it's kind of an irony here that, you know, power users, the people who are supposed to be the, you know, the cream of the crop, you know, the smartest, uh, most out there people are going to I'm going to install the Windows 8 beta on my, you know, or pre beta on my machine. And, and then all they do is complain. You know, <laughs> this isn't like the thing I already know. Well, yeah. it's not the kind of complaint you would expect from a new user, not from a power user. I mean, shouldn't you be embracing the fact that this thing is different? See, but my, my theory is always that when you're, an, when you're a power user, when you, you've developed all of these intricate ways of dealing with things, you're less likely to embrace something new, whereas a new user doesn't know how yeah. it's supposed to work, comes in and says, oh, well, this makes more sense. Oh. Well, I wouldn't know what a control panel is, but settings make sense, whereas the power user are like, where did control yeah. panel go? Why'd they rename it? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. the other sorry, thing but is, the, um, oh, go I, ahead, Paul. No, it's okay. I was I was gonna say, um, you know, who who is actually using the developer preview? It isn't just power users because they made it an open, downloadable thing that you can put on your laptop too if you decide you're ready to yeah. take that plunge. And um, you know, there's there's a number of people who are not really the group that you would think would be looking at a developer preview who are looking at Windows 8. Right. And so you can tell in the comments, some of those people are like, wait, I don't I'm not ready for this. I don't want this. I never heard this was coming. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah, you surprise. should you shouldn't be running this. And I, I think that's an important point. This is a developer preview. It's really the, I think they opened it up to the public because they knew there was going to be such an outcry for it. But, you know, really, this is aimed at people that are going to write the apps that are going to make this thing a special operating system or not. You know, and that that's the point um, to complain. Um, you know, the things are different or, the, you know, they're not exactly right. It's, it's really early in the game. Like I said earlier, yeah. I mean, this is just it's not complete. So. I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I refuse to, to complain about most things because of that fact. The start yeah. menu is one I was willing to complain about because they were saying, no, that's the way it's going to work. Yeah. And I'm like, well, if well, that's the way it's going to work. This is, the, uh, <laughs> this is kind of the tough thing with this crowd. I mean, unfortunately, that is the way it's going to work. Yeah, so I know. You might as well get used <laughs> yeah. to it. Uh, I do like that on the MSN homepage today, they have the headline, latest iPhone release, air show crash. Yikes. Oh, gee. <laughs> That's a lovely juxtaposition. Is Air Show uh, kind of a variant of Air Play or something? I don't know. I think they could have put those in two different slides, maybe. Yeah. Uh, let's yeah. move on to Surface 2.0 delayed until January 2012. Uh, who's this year's Mary Jo? Yeah, this is mine. Okay. <laughs> you like Karnak, you know, I'm put starting, the Cardian in. Yes, correctly. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, you so know, what's up with you this? You know, Surface 2 is. Um, Kind of the the uh, slimmer, trimmer version of the original Surface table. It's it's a forty inch big uh, piece of screen real estate that's only four inches thick. It's like that um, slightly smaller version of the Humvee. Yes, <laughs> yes, it's the H three of Surface table. Right. And you know, it was a really big deal at CES in January this year. This was it was like the star of their show for Microsoft. Um, and they kept saying all year, "Okay, don't worry, it's going to ship from Samsung um, later this year." Don't worry, it's ready, it's coming. And this week I finally said, you know, where is it? So I pinged Samsung and I'm like, where, where is the Surface 2? And they said, oh, it's next year now. Um, Did so, we forget to tell you? Oh, right. We forgot to tell you, kind of like the Zoom. You know, uh -huh. we forgot to tell you we killed it or we forgot to tell you we're delaying this till next year. Um, but I, I had been hearing some talk from developers who've been working with the uh, SDK for the Surface 2 that came out in July that they, there were some weird irregularities with the software, and I didn't really get any more specifics beyond that. So I, I have a feeling it's not being delayed because of component issues or hardware issues, but I, I think there's something in the software, perhaps, that isn't working as they're, as planned, and they're trying to fix that. You know, the, the underlying operating system in the Surface 2 is actually Windows 7. Um, so, But they add a lot of customization, a lot sure. of touch um, capabilities on top of that and all. So... 
it's it's a very customized version of Windows 7. Um, I think it's embedded professional or one of those kind of SKUs. Would we uh, see so, a ship yeah. date at CES announced then maybe? Yeah, so now Samsung's telling people January 2012 is the new ship date um, from them for for the uh, Surface 2. And, you know, it's, not, it's also going to be available through resell, various resellers, authorized resellers, and they'll probably have it around that time or after unless something else happens and it's further delayed. Who's the target market for this? Is it yeah, really. retail establishments yeah. or Let's restaurants? See, great question. <laughs> Rich people, yeah, it's not, it's the not Kardashians, <laughs> Paul Therod. Yeah. I'll throw up maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I need a table. <laughs> <laughs> a small ass table. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to the big ass table, you want the small ass table. <laughs> Boutique restaurants. Yeah. Need this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that, I... that is the kind of thing. It's key, you know, retail establishments. Um, I think New York Times uh, did a showcase app for it showing, uh, you know, how it could be used in, in a setting where you wanted to talk about stories and share, share things, you know, in a multi-touch group way um but yeah it's it's still kind of something that no one's really come out and said wow that's that's the ultimate application for the surface um it's more of a novelty thing yeah. still yeah all right um, in the future this has got to be just rolling this stuff into some mainstream version of what I, I just don't get this as a project you know as a separate thing they must sell like 18 of these a year you know is it yeah. just about the splash factor then? Makes them look cool? People are like, oh, Microsoft. Yeah, I, I don't know. You walk into a casino. How, have you ever seen one of these in the real world? Yeah, I, I've seen one in the Sheraton. Because the Sheraton yeah. looks like one of their demo um, properties for, for it. And they sometimes have it in their guest lounges. Um, but yeah, okay. it's definitely more of I don't a, think I've ever seen yeah. one. Yeah. I don't think I, I don't think. Outside of I mean, a, I can outside picture of a it in museums, demo, maybe. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. a museum interactive display for kids or something. Uh, but... Yeah. You just don't see these things. Yeah. I mean, the good thing about this new one that's coming um, is it also can be mounted vertically. So it's almost, yeah. it almost is like a big flat screen TV mm -hmm. in a way, you know, like instead of just this giant, huge table that weighs like yeah. hundreds of Could pounds. Could you carry you know? it around on a two-wheeler like an iPod Touch? <laughs> you can <laughs> you know, It's like, this is my carry-on for the plane. I would like to play a game while we fly. It's going to be the next thing at Ikea. Yeah. <laughs> The Surface yeah. 3.0 will come yeah, in a flat call package. It something like Grognock <laughs> 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 or whatever. Uh, well, you know, I'm sorry Leo couldn't be here uh, today. He's on he's on vacation, but I'm happy that you two have welcomed me into the uh, Windows Weekly family once again, because that's what Microsoft's marketing priorities are all about this <laughs> holiday season. One big happy family. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, it is. In fact, so this is. Um, you know, Microsoft's going to launch a, a new holiday ad campaign on Sunday, this coming Sunday, during uh, the evening NFL uh, game, I hear. This is where you're going to see this first series, one of these series of commercials. And the tagline of it, of it is, it's a great time to be a family. Okay, so before <laughs> you really arrive. Like, like a, a mafia family. family <laughs> or... This is what I know. So I, I was like, what? Okay, what, what is this? But so it's it's kind of a double entendre that they're going for here. And they're talking about not just it's great to be a family that uses a lot of different technology, but they're also talking about we have a family of products ah, that, that work together. And so, you know, you've got the Xbox, you've got Windows Phone, you've got Windows PCs, and you've got Office. I, I, and all these I things can a, work together. I have a huge problem with this. Because these Which things is? do not work together. <laughs> they don't work together. That that is actually Connect works with the Xbox. They 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 work similarly, but they don't actually work together. So for, what I mean by that is, for example, if you were to plug a Windows Phone into an Xbox, you would see nothing. You cannot play the content off of the phone onto the Xbox. It doesn't do anything. Um, you know, the interaction between a Windows PC and an Xbox is um, tired at best. I mean, it uses kind of a you know a fold to drill down analogy. It's kind of a horrible way of interacting with the two. I mean. I, they they have these products that exist in all these different markets, and I suppose they have services that work across each of the products. But there, you know, there are a lot of holes there, and and yeah. this is a problem Microsoft always has. It's a know, dysfunctional family. <laughs> yeah, they're, yeah, they're, it's everyone's <laughs> a black sheep in this family, you know. <laughs> Yeah, they're not. I, I asked. I had a chance to talk to David Webster about this, mm -hmm. and he's the chief marketing strategist who is helping them come up with this whole campaign. Um, and you know, they're not going to talk. What, what they're not going to talk about is interoperability. 
and they're not going to talk about speeds and feeds. Yeah. <laughs> Instead, it's more, this is a portfolio. This is our portfolio. This is our family of products, right? And mm. so, yeah, they're not going to show you like, here's here's Windows Phone plugging into the Xbox. No, you're going to, it's going to be more about like, if, hey, if you happen to have a PC, did you know we make an Xbox? Because, you know, believe it or not, not everybody knows Microsoft makes the Xbox. I mean, we in the in the tech community, of course, all know that, but there are a lot of consumers who still don't know that. And, you know, they don't have any new Windows release out this holiday season. So they're trying to find a way to say, okay, the PC is out there. You might have heard we have P new PCs out with, you know, the thinner, lighter form factor running Windows 7. But we also have phones. So if you already have a PC, how about a phone? And if you already have a phone, how about an Xbox? Now I just feel like I'm being a pushy salesman is, is trying, uh, yeah. trying to show me the rest of his wares. <laughs> well, I, I, it's much more compelling yeah, it's, if they could weak. say, I mean, like, these all work together. Then, then it would make yeah. sense. Right, like Apple products do. You know, when people have a good experience with an Apple product, they want to buy another one. And, and one of the things they'll find is that those things do work together really well. Um, yeah. I, I, I've always been disappointed with the interoperability of this stuff. And... Whether you talk, you know, uh, when Windows Phone first came out, there was no way to access SkyDrive documents through the Office Hub. You know, that changed in Mango, finally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could, there are a thousand of these kind of examples, these little things, you know, but um, they make all this great stuff, but they don't always make a really nice way to, um, you know, for them to work together. The, the fact that, you know, you may buy a microwave oven of a certain brand and then go into a store and say, I would like to buy other products of this same brand is ludicrous. You know, <laughs> you know I, don't, I don't think people think like that. Well, um, I think if you're confused, if you're like, well, I don't understand these refrigerators, but my oven's a mana, I guess I'll go with the Amana. That might make a little bit of sense, but I, I think in, in technology, uh, just, uh, you're, people are actually a little more familiar with those brands than they are I with mean, appliances. I mean, is that the depth of thinking you're looking for in your customer? You yeah, know? I, uh, <laughs> oh, that looks like an orange. I want that one. You know, like, I mean, yikes. Yeah, well, that's what, it, doesn't, <laughs> you know? it doesn't work with game consoles. Refrigerators may be not that different, but a game console, yeah. it's like, well, no, I know that a Sony and an Xbox are much different. Whether I didn't know that one was made by Microsoft or not, it's not going to sway my purchase decision, I don't think. I told them. I don't think so. I said, I, I was like, what about a, what about a commercial that shows somebody like me trying to get their iPad to work with Windows and what you're going to do to help me? And they said, no, that's not one of the commercials. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and uh, we're never <laughs> not going. until the new tablets come out next year. Exactly. Will that be one of the commercials? <laughs> well, Microsoft used to always do these convoluted demos. You know, um, Office launches were a particular highlight for this kind of demo, where it would be a scenario. You know, Bob is a worker in this company and he needs to make a a brochure and he has right. to do this yeah, and and somehow throughout the course of this demo every single office application ever made was involved in this end-to-end -end creation you know I, an ad like that could be kind of cool i mean and you can see there are certainly there are some links you know someone could be watching a tv show through the zoom service on their pc um close the little laptop walk walk into the den turn on the hd tv continue watching it on their xbox um, use yeah. the remote app on the Windows phone to control it. I mean, uh, use the Connect to con you know control it with their hands or with their voice. I mean, there is that kind of thing, and I suppose that could be kind of a compelling demo. But I, I you know, I'm I'm a little concerned about the issues that such a demo raises because the examples of where those things fall apart are far wider than the examples of where those things actually work. And I think that, like I said, that's the problem with Microsoft. You know, they. Um, they have big ideas, but they don't really fill in the gaps. You know, they this is the the fit and finish thing at the end is always uh, their weak point, as far as I'm. Well, concerned. and you have to be careful too, because when Mary Jo, when you were re kind of explaining this concept, my first thought was, "Oh, great! The things I use at work are going to follow me home. <laughs> <laughs> I'll yep. never get away." <laughs> Yeah, right, like uh, you'll be watching a TV be. show and it will say, that spreadsheet still do, Bob. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you can access yep. it right here on your <laughs> Xbox. <laughs> Click here to yep. continue. Yeah, they, they, the, I didn't see any of these ads yet, so I'm kind of withholding judgment to like see some of them. Sure, but, sure. Um, you know, one of the, so I asked about the office scenario and the way they described it is there's a kid, it's, there's going to be at all different spots and one of them has a kid who really wants a dog. And so he makes a PowerPoint presentation for his family about here's why I should have a dog. I'm responsible. It's good for the family, you know, as far as um, having another member of the family. And he presents the PowerPoint and then he gets the dog. And so then his dad tries to do a similar thing with why I should get to golf on Sunday. He does a PowerPoint oh and he doesn't Ugh, get it to geez. go. Yeah. I would punish just... my child if he made a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> 
What is wrong with you? <laughs> Don't rely on PowerPoint, kids. <laughs> You heard it. There are four bullet points on this slide. Have you never made one of these before? I can just hear what you're saying. You don't have to write it on the PowerPoint, kid. <laughs> right. I, I got to say, for, when you think about what have they got going into this holiday season, right? They've got the new Xbox Live um, dashboard coming, sure. you know, with the big capabilities and all that. And they've got Windows phones. But they've got to kind of fill in the gaps here because it isn't a big year for them to have a lot of new PCs. I mean, there again, there's some new laptops that are just out that are thin and light. Um, yeah. But uh, the campaign's not going to really talk about tablets because they've got kind of a very mixed bag story right now on tablets until Windows 8 comes out. So um, they're trying to kind of skip around all the things that they're missing. Mango's kind uh, of the newest thing they've got, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It is. And, well, uh, the new Xbox Live um, update that's the coming. The software update. But sometimes they, people are like, well, yeah. it's the same Xbox. So that, that that's harder yeah. to yeah. translate. You can, you can make a phone sound more new with a new software update yeah. than you can the Xbox, I think. You can. Yeah. Yeah, but also with the new Xbox, they could try to sell more connects to people sure, who still haven't sure. bought it on uh, that. Microsoft you know. doesn't, they don't know how to market. You know, if, if Apple had the Xbox 360, I can assure you that their ad would say, they would have this big thing on their front, the front page of their website where they would say, free dashboard update. It's like getting a brand new, new Xbox, Xbox for free. Yeah. Right? You know how they would market this. It would be great. And... Uh, Certainly, what Microsoft is, do is doing is just as good as any other and we'll you know, Apple TV you a $5 type update or whatever. Accounting fee. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the Apple does. Now with Excel thing. compatibility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh. All right. Let's uh, take a quick break and thank our, our last sponsor, uh, Newegg and Gazelle have partnered up. Uh, to give you an easy way to get rid of your old gadgets and get credits at Gazelle. I, I obviously, I've sh shopped at Newegg a bunch. I'm sure both of you guys have shopped at Newegg at least once in your life. You had to have. Uh, and, and Newegg is a great way to get new gadgets. Uh, anybody in the audience, we got an audience here. Anybody shopped at Newegg? Show of hands. Two, two out of the five, three, three out of the five. All right. That's sixty percent of our audience surveyed has shopped at Newegg, and so this is basically like getting stuff from Newegg for free. Uh, Newegg provides you a way to get over eighty-four thousand products. It's an award-winning website. They equip their customers with information to help make decisions, like detailed specs. Uh, this is the place to get memory. It's a place to get hard drives. It's a place to get. GPS devices, cameras, all kinds of things. And you can take all those old gadgets and trade them in. You got an old iPod Touch, HTC Sensation, Motorola Droid Bionic. You can get $100 or more for those things by using the Gazelle powered trade-in. So round up all your used gadgets from your home or office. Go to newegg.com slash trade uh, and see what your gadgets are worth today. Newegg will give you a gift card for the cash value of your electronics. And the sooner you trade, the better the price you get, you know, because gadgets just get older, they get they get worth less. Go to newegg.com slash trade, check it out. Uh, we thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. So we're going to finish up with a little Q&A here. I uh, just want to take these from the chat room. So if you're in the uh, chat room at irc.twit.tv, uh, let us know. Question for either Mary Jo or Paul uh, or me, but really these are the guys that, that know what they're talking about. I'm just going to defer to them anyway. I would, I would enjoy if all the questions were for Tom. <laughs> Tom, how do you like doing Windows Weekly? Who are you wearing? <laughs> uh, yeah, so so uh, I'll, I'll start with my question. Uh, did the Zune revive over the past week, or is it still dead? No, it's still dead, Jim. It's still dead. Okay. Thank goodness. Uh, you know, this is a great back. question. Jimmy asks, uh, what do you think of Apple's Siri compared to Tell Me? So I need to try it first. I, I will say, based on the demos I've seen, it seems like it's more extensive and it seems like you know more full featured. So uh, the Tell Me stuff is actually very good. The uh, phone, the speech capabilities in Windows Phone are particularly good. But you know, I look at those demos and I think this this is more going on there. So I've actually ordered an iPhone 4s, which I'm embarrassed to even admit, but I did so because that's the only way you can test this and. Um, if there's anything big about the iPhone 4S, and there isn't much, I mean, I think this would be it. So I, I will need to test that to see. But uh, everything I've seen so far suggests it, that it's more advanced. Mary Jo, yeah, you have I any like, Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, we, we've seen Microsoft do some demos, um, like at, at a recent speech conference in New York, where they show something that's more along the lines of Siri, you know, where you could say to your PC or, you know, um, set up my schedule for my Los Angeles trip, you know, but that... They told me that's that kind of capability is years away still, like you know three plus years. So, 
you know, that actually goes a step beyond Siri in a way, because um, it's pulling together a lot of different resources that are on your machine. But I, I, I think with what you get on Mango now, you are, from what we've seen demo-wise, um, oh, you know, you're not quite at that level that they're promising with Siri. So I, I'd say Microsoft knows they've got things to do there, and they're already working on it, um, especially around the natural language capabilities they're building with the Bing team in conjunction with the Tell Me team. I, the other thing, I guess, this, the saving grace here for Microsoft and maybe Android, I guess, is that it doesn't seem like a lot of people are using the voice recognition stuff on smartphones. And obviously, if, if the Siri thing is very, very good, maybe that will change. Um, and that could be a problem for the other platforms because the corresponding functionality would be so bad it would be painful to use. But um, it's funny, you know, the, the, the <laughs> smartphones aren't really used to, you don't really talk into a smartphone <laughs> very often, you know, when you think about it. Uh, most people aren't using that thing as a phone. They're using it as a portable computer um, and doing, you know, doing other things with it. So, um, you know, we'll see. I mean, those demos were very compelling, but, you know, demos always work well in a lab. Uh, we'll see how that works, in, you know, in real life. I think the smartest thing they did with Siri was tie it into Wolfram Alpha because a lot of these hilarious question and answer mm -hmm. the screenshots you're seeing are Wolfram Alpha driven it, and it, it begs for a Doonesbury style rip down where this thing will work like character recognition did on the Newton or whatever, i.e. does not work. And, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, Mary Jo, uh, Punk27 in the chat room wants to know if you know anything about a new Visual Studio release date. Um, I think the next version of Visual Studio will be out sometime next year since um, it, the code name of it is Visual Studio 11, but the actual name that a couple people have let slip is Visual Studio 2012. Um, so uh, I don't okay. know exactly when it'll be out, probably towards the end of the year, I would think. Um, but I'm, I'm betting still next year, late late next year. Do you think Microsoft will go back and forth between numbers and years in, <laughs> in naming? If they, no. I hope so. <laughs> uh, San wants to know, will Zune software be part of Windows 8 at release? Do we know anything about that? We don't know. Uh, the the media software we've seen so far has been uh, a metro-based audio and a metro-based video playback app, neither, neither of which exists in the, uh, you know, the developer preview build. And then what we have in there right now is just Windows Media Player. Um, I had hoped that they were going to consolidate their media playback apps and would have a single app that would do everything. Um, I don't, I guess I don't expect that at this point. You know, they already revealed that Windows Media Center would be part of Windows 8, although we don't know what form that's going to take. It could very well be just the version for Windows 7, perhaps as an optional install, perhaps as a download. You know, we don't know. So I don't know. Getting a lot of questions about Windows 8 here that can't be answered at this point. Yes, because it really those are the is best just kinds a, of questions. A developer preview. I, mean, <laughs> I want to reemphasize what we were talking about earlier with that. Uh, this this is a, isn't a developer preview, but some of these questions are about device drivers and cost and and those sorts of things. <laughs> what is the schedule for Windows 8? I mean, when when will we actually see a beta? Yeah. When when do we think we'll see a release? And and when when will we be, be able to answer these kind of questions? Well, we know. All we know for sure from Microsoft is there's going to be one beta, then there's going to be a release candidate, and then it's going to RTM. Um, they don't, aren't telling us the dates of any of those things. So a lot of people are speculating beta is around CES or sometime thereafter, shortly thereafter, which would be Jan January 2012. Um, but if they stick to the exact kind of a schedule they have with Windows 7, it probably will RTM in the summer, uh, late summer of 2012 and be out by fall on new PCs. Yep. And uh, Web4053 wants to know if Windows XP legacy apps will run, and if so, in an emulator on Windows 8? I can't remember the answer to that. So the way it works right now is uh, if it runs in Windows 7, it will run in Windows 8. If it is something that today requires, uh, you know, XP mode, uh, they haven't announced their exact plans for that, but Windows 8 does include the, a client version of Hyper-V, which is a more powerful uh, virtualized environment. I guess the question would be whether you get a free Windows XP license with any particular Windows 8 versions as you do in, in Windows uh, 7. So we don't know yet. Uh, Driskin wants to know for Mary Jo, the next version of SQL Server and Enterprise Manager. Any any news on that? Any? Uh, next version of SQL Server is the product codenamed Denali. Um, they're in the CTP3 stage of that. 
um, which they've been for a couple months. And I asked them this week when I was ta when I was talking to them at uh, the Sequel Pass show if there's going to be a beta. There's not. So CTP3 is the last test version. Um, then they're going to RTM. Um, they are the official date for RTM is sometime in the first half of 2012 for Denali. Um, oh. But the leaked um, kind of date from their own president of that division, Satya Nadella, was more towards the early part of 2012. He said that um, at a, during a conference appearance uh, about a month ago. So they're they're almost done with with the next version of SQL Server. I'm not I'm not sure about the enterprise manager component. This person's asking about specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but almost everything that's in that rev is going to RTM around the same time. Although I think I did read that Crescent, which is the new PowerView um, tool, is going to RTM probably uh, later next year and not at the same time as the core database. Aaron B., uh, always, I, I think maybe I get this question every time I do a Q&A with you, Paul. Uh, what do you think of the newest Call of Duty game? So uh, this is going to be an interesting fall because Battle for L3 obviously looks incredible. I I'm not going to get this right. I just saw an ad for it. Um, uh, the Battlefield 3 tagline is something like above and beyond the call, which of course is a reference to Call of Duty, which I enjoy. Um, call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 is, I mean, for me personally, is probably going to be it, but we'll see. I, I think both of those games are going to be great, but we'll have to wait and see. So far, Battlefield 3 has looked almost photorealistic from what I've seen, but I don't know. I still I like the Call of Duty multiplayer, personally. Got a question from Reefer about Min Windows. Uh, he says, what the heck are they doing with DLLs and such? <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, the post this week on the memory management um, changes that they made, they never actually called out the word min-win in there. Oh, but I think a lot of those things are happening for, mm -hmm. because of that, right? I mean, what min-win is, to refresh everybody, is that they're kind of reducing the dependencies and kind of detangling the mess that is Windows. And so by doing that, it's going. it kind of layers Windows more um, to be very overly simplistic about it. And... Um, Microsoft's using a lot of MinWin code inside of Windows 8. Um, people who, who've hacked the builds have seen a ton of references to MinWin. Um, but it's not, so, like Paul said, it's not something they're going to say out loud because it's a code name and they don't want to get into those lower level details. But it's in there. It's definitely in there. Yep. I, I think that the, the componentization that MinWin is an example of is just what makes these uh, small devices possible or the ARM port, you know, that they have componentized this thing down enough um, that they can have a very small version of Windows that runs in with very few resources. And I think that that's really just the point of all this. A couple of people are asking, does that mean the registry goes away? Well, I think it does actually go away in the new Windows runtime, right? We don't uh, have a notion of a registry for those types of apps. And in that new runtime, these things are self-contained. They're very similar to Mac apps, or if you are a Windows Phone developer, they're very similar to Windows Phone application packages. So, yeah, it's kind of a new... I mean, the registry will be there for backwards compatibility purposes with legacy apps. But, yeah, this may, in fact, finally be the long-awaited beginning of the end. You know, as Winston Churchill has said, it's <laughs> not the uh, beginning of the end, but it might be the end of the beginning, uh, you know, for the for the registry. Right. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your questions uh, in the IRC. We uh, we don't have a uh, tip of the week or software pick of the week this week. Eh? I, uh, so I, I, I was in Europe this week, so That's I'm kind right. of um, a little jet lagged and whatnot, so I apologize for that. Uh, well, I apologize for, for not having one of my own to back you up. The, the, I'm embarrassed for you, I sir. I feel like Rim now that <laughs> the, the, the failover <laughs> failed. Yeah. Uh, I, it's not, it's, you know... What are you going to do? Uh, the Enterprise Pick of the Week is still here, though. Mary Jo will save us. What do you got? Yes. Yes. Um, so my Enterprise Pick of the Week is Dynamics NAV, which is one of Microsoft's four ERP products. And the reason it's my Enterprise Pick of the Week is Microsoft had a conference this week in Florida where they talked about the future of that particular product. And what's most interesting about Dynam Dynamics NAV is it's going to be the first version of one of Microsoft's ERP products that is hosted on Windows Azure. So finally, ERP from Microsoft is coming to the cloud. And they actually gave a, sh a ship date target for it, believe it or not. One of the few divisions at Microsoft still sharing ship date targets. Um, they, they're they saying they think it'll be in the field in September or October of 2012. 
Um, and they even did a demo of it this week at the show where they showed accessing um, the ERP product through a web browser. So they're really making a lot of changes um, to their Dynamics ERP suite. Um, and Dynamics Nav, uh, code name 7, is the version that's coming out in the fall of next year. That's going to be the first one that goes to the cloud. Excellent. I, I, I'm only pausing because I just realized uh, I, I might have a tip <laughs> to save you, but I want to make sure I remember okay. uh, what it's called. I was, I was just doing this last night. I, I needed to record uh, some audio off of a web page in uh, Windows 7, and yep. uh, it's so much easier to do in Windows 7 than it, than it was in Windows XP and, and before. Uh, you, really? just, you just go, I use Audacity free piece mm -hmm. of software, uh, and then you go into your sound preferences, and that, that's what I was trying to look up as the, well, becomes the playback wording device. of it, but you can actually select your sound yeah. card as the recording input device, uh, and then you're able to just use Audacity. You don't have to get one of these crazy, you know, third-party software solutions to capture the audio within. Uh, so I wish I had a, a better way of putting that. But here's, how, here's what I have to say about that. You, sir, have shamed me. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the point. <laughs> That's just a, a happy side benefit, maybe for some, but yeah, good. Yeah, not yeah. for me. <laughs> it's right. <laughs> uh, internal wave capture export feature—that's what it's called—and uh, it actually came along in Windows Vista, um, uh, and it's in Windows Seven now. So, yeah, there we go. There it is. That's my tip. I just—I was trying to think, like, what have I done recently that would be of any interest? I'm not sure how interesting that is. What have you done? What have you done? <laughs> now, hopefully, I didn't close the lineup in the rest of that. Uh, because we have Codename Pick of the Week. How does this work? This is new. Last time I, I hosted Windows Weekly was in February. Uh, Mary Jo's Mary, Mary Jo. Yeah, Mary Jo hadn't joined us yet. So how does Codename Pick work? So Codename Pick, I, I do this thing on my site called Codename Tracker where I keep a, a living document of all the different Microsoft code names I can find in wherever they are and kind of what they're, what the code name stands for and when it's supposed to be coming out, anything I can find. And I put it in kind of like a spreadsheet form. Um, so this, this week's code name pick of the week is Vancouver. And so this is a Microsoft code name. A lot of people haven't heard of, uh, but Microsoft accidentally tipped their hand on it this week because they published on their download center, a privacy statement for something and in the middle of it it says code name vancouver in the file name um and what it is i believe uh from people i've talked to is it's something that may be called ultimately SQL azure analytics services and um i don't have a lot of details on it because microsoft's not talking about it beyond the little slip of publishing the privacy statement uh but the way it's been described to me from some people who've seen it is they're building this service on top of their SQL Azure database in the cloud that will let people um, who, are, who are developing applications kind of access social data. So a, a lot of information from people's Twitter feeds, um, possibly from Facebook, maybe from LinkedIn. Um, and it'll be like a one-stop API that developers can use uh, to build out applications. Um, again, how that's going to work and what people are going to use it for and how the opt-in is going to work and all, um, I don't have of those details but uh what was interesting to me is the way microsoft's starting to try to get people to use windows azure and sql azure is they're building a lot of front ends um and hoping that developers will kind of tie into tie into microsoft's cloud on the back end so you know they they haven't really gotten a ton of traction for azure just try to get people to jump on the azure bandwagon but the way they're trying it now is you're saying hey what if you are say a windows phone developer and you want to take a you know, build an app that takes advantage of Azure on the back end. Um, so they've got, a, you know, toolkits mm -hmm. for Windows Phone, Windows 8, iOS, Android. Um, and now they're starting to do some of these other kinds of services that, again, tap into the back end of Azure uh, and almost let people use it without knowing they're using it. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's kind of a new way um, that they're trying to uh, build adoption for Azure without people having to just jump wholeheartedly onto the platform and, and commit to it in full. Seems like that would take a little bit away from Amazon's space, no? Yeah, Microsoft's um, cloud platform's a little different from Amazon. It's more of a true um, platform as a service platform with a developer story, and Amazon is traditionally more of an um, infrastructure as a service platform. I mean, they're both cloud platforms, but Microsoft's kind of more akin to 
um, like what Salesforce is doing in the cloud um, or even Google mm -hmm. App Engine, a little more like that than they are like Amazon. Gotcha. All right. Thank you both uh, for uh, allowing me to host along with you uh, and fill in for Leo Laporte. Mary Jo Foley, a pleasure. Uh, I've been an admirer of your work for years. It was, it was a pleasure to host a show with you. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, let mm -hmm. folks know where they can find your work online. Yes. Allaboutmicrosoft.com is my blog on ZDNet. And Paul Therott, a pleasure as always, sir. Thank you, uh, sir. Let you folks too. know anything uh, special that you're up to at winsupersite.com or any of the other stuff you're doing? I actually, I'm going to finish up some Apple stuff this weekend. I've got an iOS 5 review, which is incredibly lengthy, unfortunately, and an iCloud. Sanofsky lengthy or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow. All There's right. a lot there, and and you know I, I'll just say this. I mean I've I've kind of dumped on a bunch of Apple software updates over the years because most of them are fairly minor in my opinion. But as I go through all of the stuff that's in iOS 5, with the understanding that they're not changing the underlying way that the thing works, and I do feel it's a little dated in that capacity. Um, there's a lot of new stuff in this release, and it is it is in fact a major upgrade uh, for iOS. So I, it's actually a big deal. All right. We'll keep an eye out for that. Thanks, everybody, for listening or watching, and we will see you next week. Actually, Leo will see you next week on Windows Weekly. Till then. That's thanks, you guys. Thank you, sir. It was good to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks. That yeah, was really good. That thanks. was fun. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'd also like to point out that we started two minutes early, which is um, something we never, <laughs> ever, ever did. Unheard of. The chat room <laughs> was going crazy. Uh-oh. Like, yeah, you started early. You've broken our trust. Yeah. You started early. <laughs> Apparently you don't understand how this works, Tom. I know. You've been telling me this over and over <laughs> every time I host. I apologize to you and everyone. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> On time jerk. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I get in trouble with the boss about it all the time. <laughs>